recently been involved with ISAM, the International Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, that has been hosting uh, this uh, series of talks. There are many different career paths that people can take, um, and some they may find more enjoyable uh, than others. And really, I think for longevity, uh, picking a, a career uh, that you enjoy um, is really uh, important for uh, happiness, work-related happiness. At the time, as I was growing up, I was interested in becoming a professional baseball player. Because I think that it is an important um, foundation for everyone to really um, understand that distinction, because that's a huge aspect for our, uh, our field. And I think many people don't really understand the, that difference. And it, it, it is a significant difference. And it is important aspect of the staging of addiction. Well, my father went to, to Harvard um, and I had thought that I would like to go there as well. Um, I instead um, went to uh, Yale. So um, uh, added the right uh, to the truth that uh, Harvard has as its uh, emblem. And I think it's important to uh, think through these uh, processes and to be open to uh, change. When I was in the medical scientist training program, at one point I considered uh, not pursuing the uh, PhD. Uh, and this was because I really enjoyed the uh, clinical rotations. Uh, that may have been a bit of a naive uh, move, but it was um, what I felt passionate about and I thought that it would be important to pursue something that I uh, felt strongly about. Basically, the idea was that at this career stage, it's important to uh, focus one's um, efforts and to become identified uh, as developing expertise and ultimately being expert um, in a specific area. And this is, I think, a very critical career stage uh, for people um, who are going into research. I would argue that it's important to think big in uh, the research and the, the work that one wants to do, but also to think smaller and to proceed in a, a stepwise manner and to be able, over time, I've um, found it really important to be working together. Um, I think if we're going to answer the big questions in addiction, it's going to take interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. And I do think inspirational as, as Mark was today, and I think helping the next generation, plus the older generation as well, still can learn a lot. So hello everyone from all over the world. Uh, uh, welcome to the eighth talk from uh, the ISAMNIC talk series in love with addiction neuroscience. Uh, enjoy the talk and yeah, I think we can start now. Yasmi, now please. Thank you all for joining us for this in love with addiction neuroscience uh, session with Mark Potenza. I'm gonna make it short so you know since we, we, we didn't lose too much time, Mark, so don't worry. But as many of you know, Mark is an addiction psychiatrist whose research is really um, focused on the neurobiology and treatment of behavioral and substance addiction and disorders in part also you know, related to impulse control and reward related motivations. Um, Mark is unusual in one sense sometimes today because he was trained at, he's lived his academic life at Yale. So he was trained um, in, in his, his his bachelor of science and master's in, in at Yale in molecular biochemistry and his PhD in cell biology. And he also um, got his MD from Yale. And then he completed his internship and, re and residency and fellowship at Yale. And he's now currently professor of psychiatry, child study and neuroscience at Yale and the director of the, the division of addictions research problem gambling clinic and so on all at Yale. So it's really, um, I think, important for especially junior people in thinking about their careers and so on in um you know how he both training and and his whole career at one institution when many people today uh, move around a lot um he's on the editorial board of m multiple journals and me and mark has published over 600 peer-reviewed publications and you know his research is quite uh, 
So obviously translational MD-PhD he's done in terms of looking at many aspects of brain imaging, genetics, ep epidemiology, clinical trials. So, you know, I look forward to hearing about, you know, his work and his life um, throughout this, this career and how, and his, um, the impact obviously that he's had and the, the, the words of wisdom that he's going to give to so many of us. So Mark, with that, take it away. And then obviously, as we said, we will have, you know, a QA and interactive discussion um, at the end. So Mark, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you for having me in this uh, series. It's an honor to be included uh, with all the other uh, distinguished uh, speakers um, who have given talks in this series uh, to date. Um, um, so this, that's also a little unusual, but I think what um, is most unusual about this uh, talk series is that it gives an opportunity to hear things that you normally don't hear within um, a scientific lecture um, necessarily. And so I um, embraced that opportunity to go through um, some of my life and uh, some of the decisions uh, made along the way and perhaps uh, discuss some of the uh, pros and cons as well as um, uh, reflecting back upon uh, different parts of my life. So next slide, please. One thing is that is usual about this talk is that I hear, have a series of uh, disclosures with respect to um, pharmaceutical, gambling, gaming, and legal entities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I thought I would um, uh, provide an overview that this will be a, a personal journey and will focus on um, early parts of my career. I thought I'd start at the beginning, hit some highlights, share some thoughts, uh, communicate uh, gratitude and hope uh, for the future, particularly as uh, a lot of us have been having an unusual year um, uh, facing uh, challenges with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So uh, where did it all begin? Next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a tale of uh, five cities uh, with several detours, and I'll start uh, with some of the, the main cities. Uh, the first is uh, New York, uh, and New York is uh, not uh, where I'm from, but where my uh, family of origin is uh, from. Next slide, please. And so this is um, my father. My father, when he was a student in the uh, public school system in uh, New York, and um, he uh, later uh, went on to uh, graduate high school, first uh, in his family to graduate high school, uh, go to college, um, and then uh, become a professor. Uh, next slide, please. And so he was a professor at Rutgers for uh, over 40 years. He um, uh, is now retired. Uh, he uh, was a physical inorganic uh, chemist uh, by training, uh, then went on to uh, work in administration as a dean and uh, provost for Rutgers University um, before uh, retiring after 44 years at the university. Next slide, please. Uh, but his, uh, his early days in New York City, I think, um, taught him uh, different skills, uh, street smarts, uh, among other um, aspects. Uh, he uh, uh, told me stories of how he, at school, um, in order not to have his lunch money uh, taken away um, by the bigger uh, children, uh, he would uh, sometimes make deals uh, by doing other people's uh, homework uh, and getting uh, protection uh, at the school. Uh, he uh, did well uh, academically. He was uh, skipped uh, several grades um, and ultimately um, uh, went to one of the uh, Brooklyn Polytechnical Institute uh, schools in uh, New York and got his uh, undergraduate degree. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but in this uh, process, he also, uh, as I said, lived in New York City and um, uh, he, uh, in some ways, was a, a rebel with a cause. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and along the way, um, he met my mother. And this is uh, my mother and father. Um, when they, uh, my father was in the army at the time, and this, I believe, was a, um, a military uh, dance. Um, soon thereafter, next slide, please. Uh, my parents uh, were married. And next slide, please. And uh, like uh, when they were being um, receiving the rice and uh, squinting and not uh, seeing what uh, is ahead of them, uh, ten and a half months later, next slide, please. Uh, I was uh, arriving, and so this is a, a picture of me as a, an infant. Next slide, please. And um, we then. Um, this birth occurred in uh, Boston. So uh, we've moved out of uh, New York City. Uh, and the question arises, why move out of New York City? Next slide, please. So uh, my father uh, went to uh, graduate school uh, at Harvard. Um, he uh, studied under William Lipscomb, uh, who was a, a Nobel Prize uh, winner and uh, learned uh, skills in x-ray crystallography um, with uh, William Lipscomb. Next slide, please. And um, of note, um, uh, William Lipscomb apparently gave me the uh, nickname of Little Buddha uh, back when I was uh, an infant um, due to my uh, chubbiness uh, back then. Next slide, please. Uh, and a detour along the way uh, was that this, uh, my father was doing his uh, doctoral work uh, during the Vietnam War era. And being in the army, um, there was a, a good likelihood that he was going to be uh, sent um, to Vietnam. Um, however, he instead uh, was stationed at Fort Monmouth, uh, which is in uh, New Jersey. Next slide, please. And it's there that I had uh, some of my earliest uh, memories. Uh, I, I lost my yellow Tonka truck at the uh, playground. Um, uh, was probably my earliest memory. The other one being um, uh, knocked over uh, several times by our German Shepherd dog named Dante. And my mother tells me that my father had wished for uh, my name to be uh, Dante, uh, but instead she uh, advocated for Mark and. Uh, Dante uh, instead became the dog's name. And it was there that I uh, began uh, uh, with some of my uh, precocious activities, if you will. Uh, that's a picture of me running away from uh, my mother after I um, uh, found the, a box of chocolates on the uh, counter. And uh, she did not uh, think that I was agile enough at that uh, age to be able to do that, but um, Apparently, the, the picture, the data show otherwise. Next slide, please. And then um, we had a, an arrival um, uh, at, while at Fort Monmouth. Uh, my brother Michael was born, and this is a, an early photo of um, uh, us uh, incorporating him into our family and uh, me um, becoming um, acclimated to having a, uh, a new uh, sibling. Next slide, please. And then we moved to uh, central New Jersey. Um, and the big city around us uh, was New Brunswick, um, where one of Rutgers campuses is, is located. But we lived uh, across the river in a small borough, uh, 1.8 square mile borough, uh, Highland Park. Next slide, please. And this is um, uh, a small uh, city a small town, a borough, uh, where um, I, my formative years occurred um, in Highland Park in the 20th century. And if people are interested, there's a, a whole book on the, the topic, um, surprisingly enough. Um, next slide, please. And uh, during that time, um, as I was growing up, uh, I, like many other um, individuals uh, was a, a baseball fan and um, my brother uh, also a baseball fan as you can see he's wearing a, a Yankees uh, shirt. I on the other hand, next slide please, 
uh, was a, a, a Red Sox fan. And for those um, internationally, Red Sox and Yankees are, um, are big rivals. And um, at the time, as I was growing up, I was interested in becoming a professional baseball player. And at that point, um, my father, um, uh, along the way, he sat me down and explained to me gently that I was not going to become a, a pro baseball player, uh, but I did have other skills. And um, uh, while at the same time, uh, I shouldn't give up my passion uh, for uh, the Red Sox if I felt that way. Uh, but for a career path, it might be uh, better for me to pursue something uh, else. Five, please. And so uh, sticking with uh, education was the uh, message that I received, as you can see by the university uh, shirt uh, that I was wearing. Next slide, please. And um, I, education at the time was through the Highland Park public school system. And this was a small school, um, uh, 117 people in uh, my graduating class. Uh, surprisingly, um, uh, in a car ride with uh, the former chairman of our department, uh, Steve Bunny, I learned that he and his brother, Biff Bunny, who are both um, well-known uh, psychiatry researchers, uh, also both attended Highland Park uh, public school system. Uh, but as you can see by this uh, yearbook, um, there are a number of uh, references to uh, Red Sox um, uh, fans, uh, and one can see um, one person writing, Ball Sox fans are their best, that's why you're my friend. Um, another person saying, I don't mind if you like the, the Ball Sox, uh, etc. cetera. Um, you can also see that I was uh, crossing my sevens um, at the, the time. Next slide, please. And that was in part because we took a, a detour to Münster um, in uh, Germany uh, when my father uh, was on a uh, Humboldt uh, fellowship uh, back um, in the when I was nine to ten years old. Next slide, please. And so we were living uh, uh, at 18 Garden Street at Gartenstrasse Aksing, um, which is here. Next slide, please which ironically has now become a social psychiatry uh, building. Next slide, please. And then um, in the, the back, there's, this all used to be unpaved and we used to be uh, playing soccer and uh, the, the building was right next to a prison and sometimes the prison guards would be um, rooting us on, et cetera. Next slide, please. So then I uh, went back to Highland Park, uh, bringing back um, a, um, uh, a passion for playing soccer. Next slide, please. And then graduated high school and a question arose as to uh, what I um, might do. I was planning to go to college. Next slide, please. Um, and I, well, my father went to, to Harvard um, and I had thought that I would like to go there as well. Um, I instead um, went to uh, Yale, so uh, um, uh, added the light uh, to the truth that uh, Harvard has as its uh, emblem. Next slide, please. And then moved to uh, New Haven. And as uh, Dr. Hurd uh, mentioned, uh, I've been uh, at New Haven since my uh, undergraduate uh, days. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, Yale College. Next slide, please. And there, um, while at Yale, uh, over the summers, I would do uh, research. And I worked with my father um, on research projects and was thinking of uh, becoming a, a chemistry major. So this is one of my earliest uh, publications um, into x-ray crystallography, uh, probably my first first authored uh, publication. Next slide, please. And then um, had a decision while I was under, an undergraduate as I started to think about what I might want to do next. And I think it's important to uh, think through these uh, processes 
and to be open to uh, change. Next slide, please. So um, I kept in a, an open mind, and instead of majoring in uh, chemistry like my father, shifted um, my career. It wasn't a, a hard um, change, um, but more of a gentle shift uh, towards uh, molecular biophysics and biochemistry. And my research project uh, as an undergraduate um, was to uh, study uh, vesicular transport in yeast as a, a model uh, organism, uh, given the uh, genetic manipulation that could be done um, at the time. Next slide, please. And so after uh, graduating uh, college, there were multiple questions. Uh, as one can see, it was the uh, 1980s, uh, so um, big hair was um, uh, of the, the norm back then, uh, or at least for some. Next slide, please. And so uh, getting more training um, after uh, college uh, was uh, the next step uh, for me. And I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, so I thought I would go into the uh, medical scientist training program, which is the MD-PhD program. I thought that this would provide flexibility. Um, at the very least, it would allow me to uh, communicate across disciplines uh, for doing uh, future research. Um, it would also, if I wanted to choose one path or the other, um, give me uh, training um, to be able to do, for example, uh, clinical work if I so uh, chose. Uh, when I was in the medical scientist training program, at uh, one point I considered uh, not pursuing the uh, PhD. Uh, and this was because I really enjoyed the uh, clinical rotations. Uh, and um, I came to the point of meeting with one of the deans at the medical school at that point, and he encouraged me to do several uh, laboratory rotations. And so I joined uh, Michael Lerner's lab um, aiming to uh, clone an opioid receptor uh, through a, um, a novel um, mechanism. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is me back in the uh, lab, back when I was doing um, uh, benchtop research. As you can see, I have a, a, an armful of Petri dishes. Uh, next slide, please. And this novel uh, bioassay uh, was um, based on the uh, skin cells of frogs. So frogs, certain frogs like uh, chameleons can change their skin color. And frogs uh, like Xenopus lavis uh, do this by translocating their pigment granules across the cytoskeletal network. And um, Michael Lerner, uh, discussed with me a project uh, where we would use this as a, a bioassay. Um, uh, and at the time, I was interested in, as I uh, noted, um, cloning an opioid receptor. Never got to that point uh, because, like many things in research, um, it often takes more time than uh, one anticipates. And it's important to uh, keep in mind that. Um, each step along the way uh, can be um, time consuming, but also rewarding. And it's important to communicate the aspects uh, of uh, the research that's being done in a stepwise fashion. Next slide, please. So this is um, a, a slide demonstrating what happens um, uh, in the frog, in the living organism, uh, versus in uh, the cell culture dish. And uh, what uh, is shown in the, the two bottom frogs is one on the left has been injected with melatonin and one on the right uh, with melanocyte stimulating hormone. And uh, the latter, MSH, uh, leads to pigment dispersion, uh, the former leads to pigment aggregation. And this is done um, endogenously uh, through G-protein coupled receptors um, in the frogs. Uh, what's shown in the Petri dishes, uh, in the cell culture dishes uh, above, are um, equal numbers of 
dermal melanophores uh, plated onto the dishes, um, where the uh, dish on the right, the darker dish, um, has been treated with MSH, and the dish on the left uh, has been treated with melatonin. Next slide, please. So then we use this in a, a microtiter uh, cell plate uh, to uh, assess the activity uh, here of endogenous uh, ligands. We later um, uh, determined the uh, transfection parameters so that we could uh, get the cells to express um, uh, G protein coupled receptors that they normally did not express. And uh, this microtiter plate shows dose response um, effects uh, for MSH and melatonin, uh, where we could, um, by varying the concentration of melatonin and MSH, um, induce varying degrees of uh, pigment uh, dispersion or aggregation that could be read efficiently uh, by microtiter plates. And then by um, incorporating um, uh, DNA into the cells, getting them to express uh, receptors that they were not previously expressing, we could um, either measure the activity of uh, drugs on the uh, cells in a rapid fashion or uh, through individual cell photography uh, techniques, identify cells that were expressing uh, novel um, uh, DNAs. Um, Next slide, please. And this is now um, demonstrating uh, via uh, cyclic AMP um, assays, um, comparing the cyclic AMP levels to the uh, pigment uh, cell dose response uh, curves. Next slide, please. And then one of the uh, publications that came out of my uh, graduate uh, thesis work um, was an early uh, functional expression and characterization of human D2 and D3 uh, dopamine receptors uh, using this uh, bioassay uh, that um, I developed as I worked with Michael Lerner and others to develop as a, a graduate uh, student as my uh, thesis uh, project. Um, this, uh, ironically, uh, is a line of research that um, we continue today uh, to try to understand uh, human D2 and D3 uh, contributions um, to uh, addictions. Uh, and we've, um, within the past several years, uh, published uh, on how um, different um, how D2 and D3 receptors may um, link in um, uh, opposite directionalities uh, to addiction-related measures in uh, cocaine use uh, disorder. Uh, so I think this speaks to the uh, translational uh, aspect of some of this early work. Next slide, please. So um, graduating graduate in medical schools, um, uh, now what? So. The answer, next slide please, was to get more training. And so I had to think about uh, what uh, the next step in training might be. And I thought that at, my thinking at the time was that the brain is the most complicated organ, uh, that we will not understand it fully during uh, my lifetime and, and likely beyond, uh, that there will always be uh, new aspects to study and always um, uh, work for me to do if I chose to this line of research. And of the brain-focused medical fields, I thought psychiatry seemed the uh, most interesting and probably had the conditions that um, were arguably the most complex um, to understand and to solve. Uh, so I uh, looked into psychiatry residency training programs, and I entered the uh, neuroscience residency, residency training program uh, at Yale. And one of the benefits of the program was that it afforded a considerable protected research time. And this is something that um, early on I thought was very valuable 
in terms of what was important to me. And I would encourage if people are interested in research, trying to um, negotiate uh, productive research time such that uh, one can um, move the, their work forward. Next slide, please. And so uh, when I entered the uh, neuroscience residency training program, um, Eric ne Nessler um, was the person with whom I uh, was going to be uh, working and uh, did some work uh, during the NRTP with him. And he had also been on my uh, thesis uh, committee. Next slide, please. And um, with uh, Eric, um, became involved in preclinical research. Some of this was um, cell-based using the melanophore-based bioassay, and others um, uh, was in uh, rodents, uh, where uh, we investigated genomic regions um, that related to corticosterone levels in rats, as well as um, genomic regions related to amphetamine-induced locomotion um, and um, uh, G alpha uh, I3 levels in the nucleus accumbens. Next slide, please. But uh, again, something uh, happened uh, during my residency uh, training, uh, somewhat similar to what happened during my medical school uh, training. Uh, during uh, PGY1 um, and PGY2, uh, periods, I uh, became involved in clinical research, largely with uh, Chris McDougall, who studied impulsive and compulsive disorders. And when I went back to the bench top to uh, do the work with Eric Nessler, I missed uh, the clinical aspect of what I was doing. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the clinical research in which I had become involved uh, was looking at uh, medications to um, uh, to see what might help people with um, impulsive or compulsive um, disorders. Next slide, please. And so this is where I made a, a, a more dramatic career shift. Um, as I, during my PG3 year, I made the decision that I was going to uh, leave Eric Nestler's uh, group and to uh, forge ahead into a, a new area of research. Next slide, please. Um, I, and that new area of research was to study uh, pathological gambling, a condition now called gambling disorder. Um, and the rationale that I had was I thought it was a clinically relevant phenomenon. It was understudied. Uh, at that time, there was no pharmacotherapy uh, study that had been published with uh, more than one subject. There are no brain imaging uh, studies that um, had been done. And importantly, I thought that this could have a significant um, clinical and public health uh, impact. Uh, that may have been a bit of a naive uh, move, but it was um, what I felt passionate about. And I thought that it would be important to pursue something that I uh, felt strongly about. Next slide, please. So um, I, during that, um, as I was um, making that shift, uh, I was also approaching the end of my uh, residency. And that's when I decided to pur pursue addiction psychiatry training. And there were several reasons why I made that choice. Uh, one was my clinical impression that gambling disorder was more similar to substance use disorders than it was to obsessive compulsive disorder. And these were two of the main competing theories um, at the time uh, that later played out in terms of involvement in DSM-5 research work groups and uh, World Health Organization work that uh, considered uh, how best to classify uh, gambling disorder and led to reclassification in DSM-5 and ICD-11. The fellowship also uh, led to subspecialty certification and uh, importantly gave me uh, protected time not only to do research but also to apply for grants. And this was an area that I hadn't really fully uh, considered and perhaps uh, was a bit uh, naive at the time. Next slide, please. 
Um, but I was also, I also had the benefit of uh, being mentored by uh, several um, outstanding people. My two primary identified uh, mentors uh, included uh, Stephanie O'Malley and particularly uh, Bruce Brownsville. Uh, next slide, please. And Bruce uh, would always ask me, uh, or would ask me several times, what is your t-shirt statement? And basically, he was asking me to focus at this point of uh, my career. And basically, I said that it's the neuropsychopharmacology of pathological gambling. Um, it was no longer the, the Puma that I had on my t-shirt back in uh, high school. Um, but basically, the idea was that at this career stage, it's important to uh, focus one's um, efforts and to become identified uh, as developing expertise and ultimately being expert um, in a specific area. And this is, I think, a very critical career stage uh, for people um, who are going into research. And I was um, very fortunate to have um, uh, such an outstanding cadre of mentors early in my career. Next slide, please. So um, during the uh, fellowship, during the, that postdoctoral period, I applied to and received support from the American Psychiatric Association's Drug Abuse Research Scholar Program. And so this is a, a K-12 program that was administered by the APA. Um, and this is an entry level uh, K award. And the important thing that that uh, provided was additional protected time for pursuing research and getting um, initial uh, studies up and running, building a, a laboratory, if you will. And this um, support uh, permitted initial pharmacotherapy and fMRI investigations into pathological gambling. Next slide, please. And these were some of the uh, studies that were um, supported um, by the, um, the Drug Abuse Research Scholar uh, Program. Uh, next slide, please. And so what I uh, learned uh, along the way uh, was that it's important to keep an open mind and to listen to what, um, what one thinks is important. Um, so there are many different career paths that people can take, um, and some they may find more enjoyable uh, than others. And really, I think for longevity, uh, picking a, a career uh, that you enjoy um, is really uh, important for uh, happiness, work-related happiness. And I feel very fortunate um, to be able to uh, think about uh, clinical concerns uh, that we can uh, address in research settings and try to advance uh, prevention, treatment, policy, public health efforts. Um, and I also uh, try to uh, keep an open mind uh, with respect to um, how best to focus uh, research at this time. You know, for example, um, the while Bruce was very supportive of um, uh, studying a gambling disorder, he said, you, know, uh, you can study behavioral addictions, just don't study uh, sexual addiction. And I think that for a while I listened to that, but as time moved on, I thought that this was another uh, important clinical area that we needed to understand better. And so, um, while it's good to uh, listen to uh, mentors, it's also good to think uh, independently. And then pursuing what you think is important, uh, I think is uh, relevant and what, what has driven a lot of my uh, thoughts about this is what is important from a public health perspective or a clinical perspective. And addictions are among the most impactful uh, disorders to people and societies, the arguably the most costly uh, conditions to society. So the area in which we're working um, in addictions is uh, important. Um, however, in 
pursuing research, and this is where I mentioned that I may have been uh, naive, uh, you, one does need to think about where one will get the support, financial support for that research. And in the United States, behavioral addictions are not, uh, are arguably not a focus of uh, NIH. So, um, however, understanding how substance use disorders are similar to and distinct from behavioral addictions may be of interest. And uh, we have uh, received R01 support to pursue that line of uh, interest. Uh, so, it's, I would argue that it's important to think big in uh, the research and the, the work that one wants to do, but also to think smaller and to proceed in a, a stepwise manner and to be able, next slide please, to be able to, uh, you know, climb a big mountain or at least, you know, uh, focused a uh, few mountains. Next slide. But also to think about uh, research uh, as, uh, you know, research products uh, as bricks and in order to um, uh, build a wall, one needs to put in, do the work brick by brick. Next, next slide, please. So uh, some additional uh, lessons are with respect to uh, trying to uh, balance work and non-work aspects, and this can be particularly uh, challenging, particularly for um, early career um, individuals who uh, may be trying to balance a number of uh, concerns uh, or um, domains. Uh, you know, keeping up uh, interests such as hobbies, uh, taking care of oneself, which um, self-care uh, during uh, internship and residency is a very challenging uh, prospect. Um, so, um, in balance, um, the the work that you do with what might um, get funding, as I mentioned on the last slide, but also to work in the self-care aspect, um, exercise, and time with family. Next slide, please. And so this is now um, you know, getting some of those domains uh, covered with respect to uh, balance, exercise, and being with family. Next slide, please. And keeping up uh, some interests, so going back to uh, the Red Sox, uh, this is uh, me at Fenway Park, uh, two different times with uh, my children, uh, Nick and Elise. Next slide, please. And then uh, the uh, first date uh, here uh, with my uh, wife at uh, Fenway Park. Next slide, please. Uh, and then being open to uh, change, and that change was uh, engagement, and next slide, please. And then moving towards um, uh, having a, a happy, uh, balanced life. Next slide, please. And in this process, over time, I've um, found it really important to be working together. Um, I think if we're going to answer the big questions in addiction, it's going to take interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. Uh, so uh, a number of the research efforts in which I've been involved um, have been uh, both multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. We have been involved in a, an interdisciplinary research consortium on stress, self-control, and addiction uh, that involved um, essentially 10 R01 level uh, projects as well as um, to uh, center uh, P30 uh, elements. And these were linked uh, going from preclinical molecular uh, to uh, public health epidemiological uh, levels. And I think if we're going to answer um, how are we going to best help people with addictions, uh, that these sorts of efforts are important. Uh, uh, additionally, large-scale studies like ABCD um, are going to be very relevant um, uh, to understanding, in, in this case, uh, addiction uh, vulnerability in uh, youth um, as uh, this uh, study unfolds. Now, working together also involves working with different societies. I've been um, 
founding member of the International Society for Research on Impulsivity, which has had um, annual conferences uh, for the past uh, over 15 years. Uh, and the group, the INSRI, has put out uh, research uh, position papers on how best to assess uh, different forms of impulsivity across species. And then um, more recently, I've been involved with ISAM, the International Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, that has been hosting uh, this uh, series of talks. And um, there are a number of interest groups, uh, the neuroscience one being uh, uh, very uh, productive, um, but we're also helpful, uh, hopeful of um, getting the a number of the other uh, interest uh, groups uh, to be similarly uh, productive. And a number of them uh, are, um, like the um, uh, policy and practice interest group um, has been very active. Uh, and we have formed a, a behavioral addictions interest group and would be very eager to um, talk with uh, people about uh, these uh, efforts. Next slide, please. So um, in conclusion, I think there are many different paths that uh, we, that many people have taken uh, to getting into uh, addiction uh, neuroscience uh, research. Um, one of the uh, aspects for me uh, early on was that the, the impulsive compulsive work uh, that I had been doing combined with the substance uh, use work that I had been uh, doing, uh, that this seemed like a uh, gambling disorder as well as a broader range of addictions seemed like uh, an important area to uh, study. Uh, I'm grateful for um, many uh, people who have mentored me. I think that uh, good mentorship is uh, something for which to be very grateful, and I try to. Um, in kind, um, be a mentor to uh, people um, moving forward. And I'm grateful for, for many things outside of work, and I think that this is really uh, important uh, in order to have longevity in a field. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, take uh, questions. Thanks very much, Mark, for your journey and what brought you um, to, you know, it, as you said, it's, it's mentors saying don't study this aspect of behavioral addiction or that aspect. Um, I, I have a couple of questions myself, but I'm going to um, uh, talk, um, give other people potential to ask first. And um, I don't know if people want to ask it themselves, but I'll start off with um, from Irene who asks, is there a difference in the dopamine receptors in people who easily get addicted to stimulants or is it a case of some people being born with fewer dopamine receptors and therefore feeling continuously unfulfilled? Yeah, so I, I think that's that a question that we always get, you know, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that it is an important question and trying to um, estimate, um, understand the genetic and environmental contributions um, to these processes, uh, addictive processes, is very important in general uh, for dopamine uh, receptor systems uh, more specifically as well. So um, broadly speaking, some uh, Genetic studies, uh, for example, the Vietnam era twin registry uh, cohort um, estimated that anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of um, addictions uh, relate to uh, genetic uh, factors, um, and the others relating to environmental uh, factors. Uh, and understanding uh, gene by environment interactions is also important in the process. So behavioral addiction, similarly, um, uh, for, for gambling disorder, it's been estimated about 50-50 genetic and environmental. Now, understanding the specific factors that are involved, um, as uh, one may uh, think that from a 
population-based uh, perspective, it may be helpful to have a, a heterogeneity of uh, people. I think with respect to considering environmental factors that are linked to addiction susceptibility, like uh, stress, uh, different types of stress, that um, there are some people who are very stress sensitive and others who are uh, more stress insensitive. So it's going to be important to sort out um, the specifics of uh, the environmental and genetic factors and take into account individual differences. So I think I'll, I'll stop with that answer because I think one could speak for probably half an hour on that topic. Oh, absolutely. And one of the things that does bring up in terms of genetics that, you know, make it even more challenging for um, at least chemical addictions is even for the controls because you can have a genetic risk. But if you never take the drug, obviously you're going to be put in the control group and, and vice versa. You may not have a genetic risk, but you do consume a highly potent addictive drug repeatedly and your brain becomes sensitized. And you are end up obviously in the substance use group. So that's why, you know, the genetic and uh, completely dissociating them are very complex. Another question um, is that uh, thank you for the excellent talk. Um, where do you see the field of behavioral addictions in the next 10 years? Are behaviors like compulsive buying, exercise, which I never have compulsive exercise, by the way. Yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I definitely didn't inherit that gene. Um, uh, but compulsive buying, exercise, sexual addiction are good research areas to invest for early career addiction medicine professionals? I think that's a great question, and it might in part relate, you know, how good of an investment it is might in part relate to the funding um, opportunities uh, within different jurisdictions. So um, from a clinical perspective, I think that um, things like compulsive buying or shopping and compulsive sexual behavior are really important areas um, on which to focus. Um, I think that both are understudied at this point in time. And I do think that um, uh, both of those uh, are being changed um, by uh, digital technologies. And I think being mindful of the changes in our society with respect to digital technologies and how they're used is very important. And I think that we are catching up with respect to how people have problems in these uh, areas, uh, both clinically and from a, a research uh, perspective. I think with ICD-11 now including compulsive sexual behavior disorder as a diagnostic entity, that this will help with respect to um, research in this area. And uh, with the availability of other specified disorders due to addictive behaviors as a, a diagnostic entity in the ICD-11, um, we've argued that um, behaviors like compulsive buying or shopping could be diagnosed with such uh, a, a designation and that hopefully there'll be um, more attention given to this and more research uh, done on this. With respect to exercise addiction, I think that this is um, an area where we need to understand better um, the negative effects that, you know, the, if one thinks that a, a core element of um, addiction is continued engagement despite adverse consequences, having a better understanding of the extent to which the adverse consequences um, should be considered as an addiction or not um, is something that I think is um, still being um, uh, thought through and uh, studied. With respect to uh, and, and I think one could look at pro athletes or people who do this at um, recreational levels. But I do think that there are people who exercise to the point of um, having injuries and we should be open to the idea of um, considering uh, this. Thanks. Amir had asked it's a broad question and he and then asked another, so I'm gonna put them together. So the first was, you know, how do you find the right question in research to focus on? And I mean, that's a challenging question. And, and I'd also ask what differentiates addiction and compulsion? 
Yeah, so um, with respect to right research question, uh, that is a complicated uh, question. And I think that um, for me, part of it is what is the clinical and what is the public health relevance of uh, what you want to focus on, what, what I want to focus on or what one wants to focus on. Uh, so that is a, a factor that drives um, from a, a large, you know, uh, a tall, uh, high height, um, thinking through uh, what the research question is. Um, some of the, the research uh, questions come out of what I hear people say within clinical settings, for example, and um, being open to listening to people and taking in that information, uh, as well as keeping you know eyes open to what's happening in society. These are ways that um, one can identify um, uh, important research questions, in in my opinion. Differentiating addiction and compulsion. Yeah, so this is a, a, a topic that has come up over the past uh, 10 to 20 years um, where, uh, and it was one that I was addressing with one of the DSM-5 research work groups. Historically in psychiatry, um, compulsions um, have this um, ego dystonic um, aspect um, uh, that um, addictions arguably have not had, at least in the initial stages. And um, thinking about um, perhaps addictions going from more impulsive, uh, reward-driven to more compulsive or habitual um, has been uh, an aspect uh, that uh, people like uh, Trevor Robbins and others um, have described. And I think that that is important to consider. So um, name Naomi Feinberg, uh, myself and others, um, our International Society for Research on Impulsivity, as well as the International College on Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum uh, Disorders, um, work together on a consensus piece on uh, impulsivity and compulsivity. And in that article, the group put forward a uh, definition for compulsivity, uh, and I would go towards that to that article. Um, but um, some elements are uh, repetitive uh, behaviors that may be seen both in um, addictions and compulsions, but there are also um, other aspects that distinguish the two. And um, if there. I don't know, I can try and find it and submit it to the chat room, the link to you, that paper, I'll, or someone can do that quickly, because I think that it is an important um, foundation for everyone to really um, understand that distinction, because that's a huge aspect for our, uh, our field, and I think many people don't really understand the, that difference and it, it, it is a significant difference and it is important aspect of the staging of addiction and also even the treatment interventions that are are implemented based on where someone might be from in that spectrum from that um, impulsive reward to that compulsive habit habitual behavior a number of people thank you for your inspirational and excellent talk like Christos um, I'm gonna um, read another uh, question. It's a little longer, but I think you know it tells exactly in terms of you know. Thank you for the perfect talk. I personally learned so many things as a really early career researcher. This is Mehran. Um, the question I have, based on your academic degrees, is that how important do you think these academic degrees are, and how they helped you with conducting research better? Um, was that really helpful or did you require them just to apply for different grants and different positions and you could just simply learn what you've learned from reading articles and book independent from university? Yeah. Uh, I, that's a Mehran? Okay. <laughs> I think that's a, a good question and I don't know if I know the precise answer to that, but I'll provide my thoughts on the, the topic. Um, I. I do think it 
uh, for me, was very important to have gone through the, the training um, and to have received uh, the uh, formal training uh, to be able, you know, with my MD internship residency fellowship, to be to have the training and the clinical, you know, supervised clinical care, uh, su supervised clinical training that I received. Um, it provided me feedback on what I was doing from a clinical perspective that gave me a level of comfort and assurance to be able to go in uh, to see uh, patients uh, and to treat them to the best that I uh, could. And I felt that that was very um, helpful for me. Uh, with respect to the PhD, again, it gave me um, solid, protected uh, research time. And to have that those blocks of time was really um, helpful uh, in order to be able to formulate a research, you know, take a research question, begin a project, and take it through to completion, and do that several times during my uh, PhD training. So while there are things that one can uh, learn um, through reading uh, papers, there's also something about doing this in a supervised uh, uh, setting that I think is very valuable. I completely agree. And, and I, I think that, you know, it, it's really critical. Um, you can learn many things, like you said, from reading, but the actual nuances of any field are, is actually gained by the hands-on experience and, and having mentors. Um, one question that I had, um, well, I just want to say thanks, Mark, for putting the, the paper and and also Parnian has given the actual link to, to that paper. And I, I do recommend that everybody um, take a look at it. Um, in, in keeping with the, that theme um, that, you know, about gaining the experience and so on and mentors for me, you know, one aspect of your career was that a mentor you know, didn't necessarily think that you should study certain things and like, you know, for example, uh, sexual addictions. And a question is, when do you decide to differ from, you know, to challenge or to do something? Um, I don't want to say not respect because you respect your mentors, but when you decide to actually stick to your guns and follow what you want and not necessarily what your mentor might have said. And given the international nature of this platform, you know, there are international considerations for challenging a mentor, depending on certain cultures. So I wonder if you can give us some insights into how you can, you know, working with your mentor, but still trying to pursue some of the things that you find and important for your career development. Yes, uh, I think that's a, a great question as well. Um, and I'll put this into context greater context and this goes into the context of the the t-shirt statement and an early career investigator focusing on um, an area um, another uh, senior investigator has described this as an hourglass uh, stage where you know you narrow down your focus and then later on you can broaden uh, your focus uh, and I think what Bruce was trying to communicate to me was that his impression was that this was a complicated area, particularly for a young investigator to get into at that time. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, gambling uh, and its relationships to uh, substance use disorders, he thought that that would be the better path for me to pursue given my passion for uh, that area of research. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Bruce passed in uh, 2011 before I became um, involved in uh, studying compulsive sexual behaviors. So I don't know how he would uh, respond if I had brought it up again uh, with him. Um, and it, you know, once I started to go into that line of research, I was a full professor and established. Um, so it probably was a safer area for me to go into at that point in time. Uh, I think one does need to be mindful of 
one's career stage because personally for me i think the uh, most challenging stage was going from assistant to associate professor and uh, that going getting over that hurdle is i think the a uh, very challenging one um within at least the u.s uh, system um i I don't know if anybody wants to open up their, their yeah, Hamed, I know, had a question. Sir. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mark, for your talk. It was really inspirational, and it, I really kind of enjoyed from the, every single piece that you have discussed about. Uh, you have been uh, really proliferative and productive, and I've been always kind of following what you have been doing in terms of the publications, since I was kind of a medical student, and I, every year you are publishing several papers, and I know that you are really kind of uh, active and productive in, in, in different areas in addiction medicine. I've always been wondering how you keep the balance in your life between the kind of self-care and also being able to be such a productive, well-established scientist in, in the field of addiction medicine. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a challenge. Um, you know, what my um, what I, what comes to mind is my wife saying, you know, basics first. So one does need to take care of oneself first before one does the you know the things like work. Uh, there are times in my career where that was more challenging than others. Like internship, it's really really difficult. Um, I think to have self-care, um, appropriate self-care during that time. Um, given that I was on call every fourth night at, uh, and it was more frequent for some other specialties at the, the time. Um, but, you know, I think one just needs to make priorities and uh, sometimes, um, I've, Speaking personally, sometimes I'm better at it than I am at others. <laughs> you meaning that you're human, Mark? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, um, yeah. One of one of the ironies. Um, so the one I think the last time I did not take a computer with me on vacation was maybe uh, somewhere between ten to fifteen years ago, and my <laughs> children took their computers, and I didn't go on their computers uh, but um i said i'm going to be offline for you know the the week and then when i got back it, there was such a backlog and it Big literally time. took me three days to get through everything and some people weren't happy and so i i i now made the choice that it it is far better for my longer term self care to bring a computer, even if it's just going through emails for, you know, 15 to 30 minutes in the morning, then enjoying the rest of the time. So we <laughs> all find our balance of self <laughs> No, absolutely. Three days is good. I'm, I'm way behind three days. Um, <laughs> Najme, I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, said, hello and thank you for your amazing talk. I found there, was, I found there wasn't a gap between your MD and residency. So what do you think is more appropriate for MD students to first apply for a PhD or try to start residency and then apply for a PhD? Yeah, I think um, people can take individual paths. So the, the program that I was in uh, was the medical scientist training program and it's designed to um, generate uh, physician scientists. So you're doing the uh, training concurrently. Uh, at the time when I was there, traditionally it was you do the first two years of medical school, which at the time, it's now changed, was uh, all book learning. Uh, and then you did your clinical rotations in year three and had um, electives in year four for medical school. But um, usually people did the first two years, then did their doctoral work, and then did years three and four. Um, uh, in the medical scientist training program. I didn't do it that way. I started to do um, two clinical rotations and then um, did a 
third because I liked it, then did a fourth because I liked that. And that's when I was thinking of not pursuing my PhD. Um, but again, Dean Gifford said, do a few rotations. I did. And that's when I joined the Learner Lab. Now, our Yale Center for Clinical Investigation has a program where MDs can get their PhD. Uh, they'll support um, a protected time for doing that. Um, so that's a, another way that it can be done. Um, everyone has their own uh, path, and uh, I, I would encourage to try to think through what's best on an individual uh, basis. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the U.S. at least, a lot of, I used to direct the MD-PhD program at Mount Sinai, oh. and just like Yale, we definitely also have loosened the path so people can choose if they, you know, do the PhD completely first or, or MD and, and the mixture as before, but different countries have different ways, and I do know that we in the U.S. get many people who may have had an MD first and then come here and then finish their PhD. And, and those are also really good because you already have a really strong foundation on the topic you want your, your, your PhD to be in. So, you know, I agree with Mark. I, I do think that everybody has an individual path to take. And luckily today, everything is more open to allow that flexibility. Um, Amir, um, well, I'm definitely going to ask just because it has to do with the field um, first from Madie. Um, as amazing talk, would you recommend any resources for further study in these fields? So perhaps uh, um, Hamed can, uh, Mark can give Hamed some of the, the resources that can be um, sent out um, later for the next one so that people can get some resources to look into for that. Amir asked, um, seems addiction is an uh, ubiquitous, enduring part of human experience. Do you see developments in the future that it can be turned into a positive force instead of a negative, destructive one? I, I'm hopeful um, because there are different ways that people have conceptualized uh, addiction. And one of the ways that we have considered addictions is as a disorder of misdirected motivation. Um, so if one can rechannel motivation into a, uh, a more positive, healthy direction as compared to a, um, a more destructive, negative uh, direction, I think that that is one way in which uh, that one could be hopeful of um, changing something that is associated with uh, a lot of harm to something that could be uh, promoting something good. And I, I see that, you know, uh, I've worked with a number of people in recovery uh, who are very motivated uh, to help people um, who are struggling with addictions. And some of the, the people within uh, our state's uh, problem gambling treatment program are, you know, people who are people in recovery who can understand what people are going through, are very driven, motivated to help people. And I think that's one uh, area that comes to mind in terms of thinking about a redirection of motivation. Absolutely. I also always think that, don't you think us scientists and a, a lot of physicians have an addiction that we're workaholics? So I do think that, you know, it's uh, it's part of of that. So I, I I just think it's whatever chemical or behavioral thing you happen to get onto first. But I think many of us on this talk on this platform have an addiction. We've just used it in a in a positive way, hopefully. Um, before we have uh, yes, so <laughs> <laughs> we have just a few minutes left. I want to make sure that if anybody um, uh, has another. Um, question that they want to make sure. Hamad, you were going to say something. Sorry. No, no, I was just going to remind people that we are going to have the next talk by Professor Kathleen Brady, uh, immediate past president of ISAM. So we are going to have the kind of the next talk. And we have already started to put together a list of kind of nominees for the second year of this talk series. So we have started to kind of see what are the, the other champions that we can invite from uh, different countries so we'd like to be diverse 
and we like to include people from different diverse backgrounds from different countries so please uh, help us to find kind of champions in your own country and i can always already see we have people from something like 20 different countries right now in in the kind of in the uh, in the, the meeting room so i hope that people from different countries would introduce uh, their own kind of speakers from 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 other countries and we try to kind of uh, remain diverse and inclusive in this talk series so that is one of the kind of the motivation for this talk series um definitely i i think it's a, a really good um uh, you know we've all suffered because of covid but interestingly you know these um types of forums have allowed the international discussion on a way that uh would you know would say um uh, jason just said yes would love to see a speaker from jamaica in the caribbean um well jason you are gonna get that because actually i am jamaican and i will be speaking sometime <laughs> later i was born in jamaica very proud of that so oh, you I, make I, some noise one more yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many people don't realize it's funny, like, yep, I'm Jamaican. So we will be talking reggae in a few months. <laughs> um, so, um, but definitely give Hamed and the, um, you know, all of, give the suggestions so that we do cover the globe, because I do think that this platform um, is important for that. Um, one question that I did want to ask Mark, I didn't want to take up all that is, you know, a lot of, um, yes, we in the house, Trisha, great. Um, a lot of Jamaicans are online more than you realize, Hamad. Um, you know, Mark, is there something in terms of like, you know, a lot of young people and, and older in terms of career decisions that you made, is there anything that you regret? Is there something that if you, you know, um, giving that kind of insights, I know it's a tough question, um no one leads the perfect path but is there something in particular that you would want to change and do differently and you change yeah yeah i think there are certainly um some times where i felt like i hadn't been um working um either quickly enough or um getting uh, into the field at the right time like i even felt that when i started doing the uh, gambling disorder research. And I was like, if I had started this a year earlier, just think of how much further along I would be. Um, but, you know, in, in retrospect, I, you know, I, I think that it's worked out. I'm very grateful for how things have worked out. And I think it's important to be mindful that um, the field moves ahead at a, a pace. and. Um, so I, I regret that at the time I was feeling perhaps more um, anxious or disappointed. Um, but I think over time I've gained wisdom to kind of accept how things go. <laughs> I think that, you know, um, clearly your career has been successful, even like you said, though, um, we always want something to go faster. I know I suffer from that type of anxiety even today that, you know, not moving fast enough, not, you know, but it, it is tough, especially, um, you know, you're competing in a way to get funding and sometimes you're, you feel like you're not publishing enough. Even though, Mark, you've been so prolific, as Ben says, I don't know how much more you can publish considering you've, you've published, you know, quite a lot and how do you get the corner of the field and i do think that one we forget that there's a, there's a lot of behavioral addictions but it's not studied that much or doesn't get the high profile as cocaine or hair opioids and so that's one of the things i think um as well in terms of you know you talk about choosing the the not choosing the field perhaps um, based on funding, but you had mentioned something about, you know, funding um, uh, kind of directing the topic. Do you think that that is indeed really critical to have that funding direct that topic for your research? I mean, obviously you, you, you need to get money, but I just was wondering as a last thing, since we do have two minutes left. 
Yeah, so I think it's finding a, a balance, just like one finds the balance between work and outside of work um, time. And, you know, you asked about regrets in that domain as well. I mean, I, I recall, and I don't regret this, but it led to one less publication. So I, at the end of my um, uh, graduate uh, you know, time before starting internship, I had a week and I could either write another paper or refinish the bookcase. So I chose to refinish the bookcase, which <laughs> we still have in the house for 25 years, but um, it meant one less publication. So, um, you know, finding this balance between, with funding, you know, uh, trying to do what, so I, I, I'm really motivated to do what is important from a clinical and public health perspective. And so I try to do things uh, at a relatively uh, relatively low budget. Uh, one Bruce used to say that if he had to calculate publications per amount of dollar of funding, I would be near the, the top of that list. Um, so, you know, these are important areas. There are limited resources, so try to do what, what you can with the, the money that you get. But you do have to be mindful that that was where I was naive. Uh, early on in my career, you do need to be mindful of what the program priorities for NIH are, for example, or for other funding organizations, um, because that's that in part does move the field, but it's also good to kind of move either counter or link onto that if you can, for example, with considering behavioral versus substance addictions. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, there is uh, some administrative things in terms of you can keep up with the ISAM news and events through the Twitter uh, um, link. And um, someone had asked about to get access to the recorded video of this webinar and um, send us an email to be able to be added to the mailing list so that you can get the video recording of the talks that are sent to. But I thought, yeah, but they will be also on YouTube. So um, they do a really great job. And in fact, she's really fast. She just put the YouTube <laughs> channel link. So please go there. I did look at a couple of them. They're they're very good. And I do think inspirational as, as Mark was today. And I think helping the next generation, plus the older generation as well, still can learn a lot. So um, if no one has other pressing questions, Mark, we thank you again for you know, bringing us along the journey. You give a, a really great um, talk and just inspiration and, and, and having the complex um, uh, career that you have and the impact that you've had on the field. So thank you very much. Thanks, thank Ahmed. You. Thanks, everybody. Have a great and thank safe you. day. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Hamid. Thank you.